to bring Dr. Kim then back into the discussion. Um, just a few questions again regarding the collaboration, and you may have covered some of this, but, but maybe just to underscore some of it. One very basic, how was the first contact made then, and who made it, and, and at what point did you say, okay, yeah, we're, we're gonna have to reach out a little farther? Dr. Kim, you wanna start with I that? I think maybe Dr. Nirula might be the better person to okay. um, answer that question, because his collaboration with the NIH kind of um, predated his collaboration with my uh, my group, yeah. so AJ. Yeah. So, so again, we you know it was March the twelfth that we we signed a partnership with Absolera, um, and you know they they brought the technology to the table to help discover the antibody. But you know Lily ha hadn't worked in virology for a very long time, and so we, you know, we we had outreach to the NIH where some of the real experts were, as well as some of the top academic labs in the world and said, we're going to develop antibodies to this vi COVID virus, but we need to be able to figure out, you know, whether it works and, and um, um, what's the best antibody to move forward, what are the right experimental systems. So, so I think it was sort of mutual outreach. I think, I think the NIH also <laughs> um, was aware that companies like Lilly were, were getting into um, development of antibodies, so they were sort of in parallel reaching out to all the companies. So I, I think it was in, in, it was sort of a mutual outreach at the in March 2020 that ended up um, um, really resulting in a lot of the science over the next 79 days that allowed us to pick the correct antibody. Um, but um, it, it was just really a case that we needed we needed help and um, um, and the NIH realized they needed companies like Lily who could do this very quickly. And then, and Dr. Kim, I'll ask you this then, at what point did you decide we needed to start accelerating therapies for COVID and we needed to work together to do that? But, <clears throat> yeah, that decision was, I think, made very, very early on. Um, it was very obvious from, to everyone, not just scientists at the NIH, that we needed treatments for COVID-19 and that while a vaccine was on its way, um, we all knew that even with the vaccine, uh, that treatments would still be needed. And so we worked uh, very quickly to establish those uh, relationships, um, as Dr. Nirula stated. And actually what the NIH did was, uh, Dr. Collins, the director of the NIH, uh, created um, what's called the active uh, platform, uh, which was a private-public partnership to oversee, an umbrella to oversee and accelerate these types of relationships with our company partners. And so that was a really an important framework under which we could actually, you know, facilitate these collaborations with um, people like Dr. Narula, you know, but more also like with the companies themselves to facilitate that um, collaboration. And so instead of taking years for us to work out the details of the collaboration, you know, we could literally do it in days. Okay, this, this may be a logistical question, but just curious, how was information shared? I mean, and how actually did you work together? It was just a direct relationship. I mean, there were really all the barriers went away because as Dr. Nirula stated, you know, what I really felt for the first time ever, I think, in, in science was that it was not about a competition with one group versus another. It was a competition with the pandemic. It was a competition with the virus. So, you know, of course we had, you know, we quickly signed confidentiality disclosure agreements, CDAs and NDAs uh, to establish that formal relationship, but, you know, there was just an openness. And we would, as uh, AJ described, you know, there were many, many uh, phone calls uh, and many times during the day on the weekends to share data um, literally as they emerged. Um, so as we became aware of one thing or another, we would call one another, we would have these conference calls um, and plan together of how to plan the next step. Yeah, and if, if I could add on, I mean, if you think about how things were done um, before the pandemic, you know, when we were sharing data with uh, external organizations, it, it would be quite slow. You, you, you'd have some data and then you'd have to go through a bunch of legal agreements, confidentiality agreements, um, and, and then maybe a few weeks later you could actually show some, some data, but, but there was a lot of creative work um, to get a lot of the paperwork out of the way. So during the discovery period for the antibody, as antibody was coming, rolling off the, you know, uh, off the machines at, at the NIH, for example, on some of the antibodies. And, and sometimes it was at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. Um, people would be meeting at midnight and looking at that data together and making decisions um, because on on um, Sunday morning, you know, 3,000 miles away in San Diego, we were going to have to 
narrow down the um, antibodies we were going to be um, advancing. So it was an incredible um, speed. And then during the clinical execution period, you know, as 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 we got data or the NIH got data, we were sharing it in real time. And you know, both both sides were modifying clinical trial design. Um, in real time, on the fly, as we got new data. It was incredibly um, um, agile, if you will. You both in your presentations talked about uh, the future. And so I'm curious to know, do, does this kind of lay a foundation for future work for both of your organizations, or does it kind of lay the foundation for how this will impact just future R&D in general? I think for the NIH, it definitely does. It, it really has set a model uh, whereby we can work, you know, has shown us that we can work much more closely with our industry partners to advance critical drugs in a very rapid time frame. And so I hope to see, you know, this model being utilized uh, more and more in the future. Yeah, I, I absolutely concur. And I really hope, um, you, you know, that this type of collaboration won't be reserved for a, another pandemic alone. <laughs> I think it's going to be, uh, there's a lot of major um, unmet needs in human health that I could see greater collaboration, you know, helping with, whether it's uh, Alzheimer's disease or malignancies or autoimmune diseases, I could see a much deeper level of collaboration in the future. This, this has set a nice sort of framework for how we could work together in the future and, and make advances quicker. Well, Dr. Narula and Dr. Kim, thank you so much uh, for your insights. Thanks for your collaboration and all the work that you're doing. We're, we're just so glad that you're here today. Thank you so much for having us.